I'm I'm actually kind of down on uh, Zoom transcripts. The uh, um, whatever company they use, I forget. Um, it's not as good as Whisper. Whisper is a lot better. Whisper is really uh, good, uh, but I'm happy to have this added feature, you know, as part of yeah, Zoom. So, and this is the Open Global Mind weekly call on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. Reaching the end of February already? Yeah. Time just goes by way too fast. Um, hey, Patty. Hey, Mike. Awesome to have you here. Um, we left last call with a lot of things on the table. Uh, haven't really focused our topic for this call. So I'd like to spend the first part of it, since it's a topic call, uh, refining through uh, to something that um, is up for the, something that's worth our time here together. What could we focus on together that we could sharpen? And it might include a burning question that one of you has for a project um, that we could sort of collect our brains together on. Uh, might be something else, but what uh, I, the floor is open for proposals, but I would love us to sit, maybe we sit for a minute and just ponder the kinds of uh, questions that we have going and then uh, then step in. Mike, do you need a, do you have a clarifying question or do you have a proposal? Uh, I'll wait a minute or two and I have, I have a debate in my own head about what to put on the table, but so <laughs> a minute will be useful. That sounds wonderful. So let's uh, let's go quiet for a minute and ponder uh, what question might we address that would be terrific use of our time here today. Uh, Is plunder a new thing, Jerry? Plunder? Yeah. Uh, you mean the habit of civilizations plundering other civilizations? I mean, you're invoking plundering in this context here. I've not heard you do that before. Where did I say plunder? Did I miss here? Okay. I think you said ponder. Ponder. Yes, yes. I'm Big like, difference. I said plunder? How did I say plunder? I heard I, I guess I heard plunder, so there's always that. That's I so did too. I did I did too, actually. Must be on must be on our, our mind our collective minds or something like that. Fascinating. Yeah, Gil and Doug going weird. All right. Uh so let's uh let's go quiet for a minute for think time and then come back in with uh, questions that we could work on together and then we'll figure out which of those we'd like to do. I used to have the Jeopardy think music as a handy thing I could turn on during meetings, which would always get a good laugh. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> but I don't anymore. I, I just realized I should probably put it someplace. Uh, Kalia, welcome to the call. I was just, at, we just were in silence for a moment to ponder, not plunder. Uh, what topic is worth our time today? What what should we really sharpen our senses on, including possibilities of questions that any one of us is working on individually that we could help you with, things like that. Uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Mike, you've got the mic. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, my brain is full of things that I would love to ponder. Um, one of them is a, 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 an issue that we're publishing a report on in a week, uh, digital leadership. And we're having a public event online to launch a report called uh, Korea's Path Towards Digital Leadership. And what we do is we look at 10 big digital policy issues that Korea is grappling with, and we give them letter grades you know, A for getting connected, F for protecting their computer systems. Um, and then we do the same for the US, Japan, and Malaysia so that we can compare and contrast and learn lessons. So that's question one. 
is how can we get presidents and prime ministers to actually step up and, and weigh in on these digital issues. We, When I was in the Clinton-Gore White House, we did a lot of this and it really made a difference. It probably gave the US a three-year head start on e-government, e-commerce, even social media. So that's step one. An even bigger issue uh, doesn't just involve presidents and prime ministers, but how do politicians get their head around emerging technologies so that they're not just listening to sales pitches and hyperbolic uh, reporting about blockchain or the internet of things or chat GPT. So that's an even bigger issue. And then the two things that have got me very depressed right now are related to information. Um, one is, purposeful disinformation, which we've talked about a lot, but we haven't talked enough about what do we do to counter all the mind control and brainwashing that is distorting our politics. Related to that is one of the oldest phrases around, and that is information overload. Uh, it's not just journalists and people who are supposed to make sense of the world. It's almost everybody who now thinks, how do I keep track of all this? So those are related issues. People are more likely to fall for disinformation if they are being swamped by stuff, some of which is true, some of which is not. So those four issues, I can talk about those. I'd love to talk about anything else that people are excited about. But uh, if people um, want to follow up with me on some of these digital leadership issues, I'll put my uh, coordinates in the uh, uh in, in the uh, in the chat and, and and one more one more issue that's come out more recently and that is another old phrase and that is generation gap. Um, I, I'm seeing more and more disconnect between people in their 20s and people in their 60s, and um, I'm not sure what to do about it. I, I just learned that uh, to all of us over 60, out of pocket means I'm not going to be available tomorrow. Under 30, out of pocket means I'm deranged. And apparently, this is something that uh, TikTok has spread to the world. TikTok, TikTok is now rewriting our dictionary. Um, Mike, think that was a wealth of, of ideas. <clears throat> um, Gil. Mike, do you or somebody have um, a map of the uh, uh, age and other demographics on different platforms? I've seen it, yeah. I mean, it's okay. striking how different it is, yeah. particularly TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, and, and, and important in relation to what you're saying about disinformation. I think that topic is very timely, um, given um, the new wave of disclosures about what the Russians have been up to. Um, but when you say, what are we going to do about it? I It begs the Ken Homer question for me of who's we, buddy? Which has we, been asked several times. We OGM, in the chat. we the White House, we you at Carnegie, who's we? No, it's, it's, the frame for this discussion that you're proposing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, in my mind, it's we people who are worried. Uh -huh. So each and every one of us. Um, Pete. I'm surprised to go so quick, but um, me too. I was like, um, Pete, <laughs> with a small uh, note of surprise, perhaps. I I like Mike's topics, and I want to suggest an additional viewpoint on on them. Uh, not not a replacement viewpoint, but a, an additional viewpoint. Um, I. I think the the we there kind of implicitly in some sense is is uh, people I will call informationists, people who actually uh, look for information, uh, think about information, and you know hope other people rationally do kind of the same thing. I think another thing I observe in the world is that most people maybe um, aren't informationists. Uh, they're going along with some flow or some set of flows that are in their life. Um, and, and they will actually kind of demonstrably ignore 
truth or correct or facts um, in favor of things that are locally more important to them, like connection uh, to their in-groups, uh, anti-connection to their out-groups. Uh, so, so those of us who are informationists kind of wonder, you know, how how is that a thing? Why would <laughs> why would anybody not follow the information if we gave them the best information? If we gave them the right amount of information, not too much and not too little, everything would work out. And um, I'm sorry to say, informationists, I don't think that's true. I I think it's more complicated than that. Thanks. I had muted myself, so I'm sitting here saying, Klaus, wondering why Klaus isn't hearing me. So please go ahead. You are muted. There we go. I'm checking my headphones. Here, so. <laughs> ah, it's me. It's me. The newbie problem. Um, yeah, I, I think the crux of the issue dates back to how we have been handling propaganda for many, many decades now. Um, when you think about the tobacco scandal, right? how come none of these guys went to jail? I mean, you had a group of senior level executives, consulting firms, PR agencies deliberately set out to mislead the American public about the risks and dangers of smoking. And it was revealed. It was in front of Congress. Everybody knew about it. These guys had done it. They admitted to it. And no one ended up in any form or shape being uh, admonished or, I mean, admonished, yes, but, but having uh, a consequence come out of this. And so the, the 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 thing, of course, is that even until today, everybody sort of is doing it, right? I mean, the Democrats are doing it to some to some extent. The Republicans are doing it with vigor. You have Fox News out there. Uh, I mean, you 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 listen into Fox News right now, spinning uh, the uh, impeachment uh, discussion about Biden and all the revelations that came out in the last few days. And you just you just think we are on two different planets because the way the information is being processed you know, within the uh, MAGA network is just it's just bluntly deliberately misleading to say it as polite as as one can. So we have no mechanisms in place to um, to to see propaganda for what it is. It's a form of warfare. Right, I mean, it, it, it's uh, the warfare uh, in the Second World War. Hitler, you know, basically did what social media is doing today with the AM radio when it came out. Right, he was. He, what this was the first time you had a platform where you could broadcast, you know, bypassing all channels, all restrictions, uh, you know, all precautions, and go directly to the base. And he succeeded wildly, and it has just become more sophisticated today. So this is not like a today issue. You know, this is an issue that we have not resolved, which is uh, to suppress the weaponization of information for political purposes. So it's a, it's a, it's a more of a big picture kind of thing in my mind. Great topic, Klaus. Thank you, uh, Patty. Then Doug. Then Gil. Yeah, um, I think the way I tend to think about this is, uh, I guess I'm really curious if there's a name for, I think there are several names for the, um, how media has become seemingly inextricably linked with um, identity and how, uh, I think in, in my observation, this is just a, um, a theory, I guess, but I suspect that there is a correlation between um, one's established how established one's sense of personal identity and self is and how susceptible they are to um narratives that have a lot of weight behind them or seem to have a lot of weight behind them and i think as i think about the people that i know in my life who are who seem i mean my my judgment would be seem prone to misinformation and, and really um ingesting a lot of misinformation and holding it as, as though it were truth um i think i have lost hope that there is a way to engage with someone who has 
assimilated the misinformation in a way that um, makes the cost of understanding differently too high. So if there is, um, so I'm just thinking of two people I know who like, it seems like their, their marriage from the, from the outside seems to have a lot of um, built or rather like a mutual um, experience and history in the denigrating of the, the other side. Right. And, and, you know, the, the Fox news experience is shared and I, sometimes I think, you know, man, like I think it would just, it would cost them so much to, entertain or be open to the world being a little different. It would cost them too much. And um, so I think the way I, I tend to think about it is if I'm interacting with someone who is holding um, what seems to me um, to be a worldview that is um, maybe not as accurate a reflection of, of, of reality as others, um, I, I have that in mind in the background. I, I think to myself, like, man, like, you know, if, if I'm in, in conversation with this person, is what I'm asking them to consider too expensive, too emotionally expensive, too expensive of their um, their inner resources to regulate as they um, consider or are open to become open to a different way of seeing the world. Funny, thank you. I, I tried to paraphrase your statement or question in the chat. I don't know if I did it well. If I did it poorly, could you please restate it there or, or just come back in and, and say it differently? But uh, and Gil is also saying that information might not be the right framing for it, but belief systems, whatever whatever that might be, I guess. Thanks. Uh, Doug. You pressed one of the right buttons. You uh, you put your hand down, but you didn't hit there. the mute yet. That's bad. Um, so in, in the spirit of... Um, doing it differently in service to generating a different result. And in the concept of doing it differently, what if um, we were to look at if we were to shift and replace a foundational feature of the present landscape with it with a replacement so if we were if there was to be a replacement of um consumption and extraction and all of that with contribution uh, on a on a fundamental principle level, on a, on a foundational value orientational level. And from that place, express the new, explore the new, put energy and attention and words to the new. Like what would, would, would the world look like if? Not informed by everything in the rearview mirror and not including the sort of orientation approach practices, data-driven research, all the stuff that is, is imposed upon um, manifesting or giving birth to new without bringing anything in other than what's needed in real time as it's explored. And I'm happy. Thanks, Doug. Um, again, I sort of paraphrased your question. Please correct me in the chat and improve on that if you'd like. Gil. Yeah. Um, still on the disinformation theme, um, maybe someone can help me here. I remember seeing something, I think in 2015, 2016, um, about Putin's explicit disinformation strategy to so show, to so SOW, social discord in the United States uh, with an objective of fraying the social fabric, building disagreement and tension within the American population. I have not been able to find the original reference, uh, but it's the lens through which I'm watching the events play out because it seems that whether that was an intentional strategy or not, that's what's happening. Uh, but this was something that put it down to uh, quite explicit geopolitical strategy on Putin's part. 
Anybody seen that? And this is a while ago. This was like, you know, uh, I think early in the Trump campaign. So I've seen several things like that where he's taking credit for it, taking credit for getting Trump elected. I mean, it's uh, and, and not just Putin. I mean, a number of the top officials have celebrated their success at, as being uh, cognitive warfare experts. But I'm asking something, I think, deeper than that, Mike. I mean, the, the election for sure. Uh, but the but the. Um, the geopolitical cognitive warfare strategy of, uh, you know, the, the great game yeah. that I think he's up to of like, you know, we're not going to beat you on the battlefield. We're not going to do nuclear war. It goes, <laughs> it goes back to Khrushchev pounding a shoe on the table, you know, um, in a very different kind of context, but it's a, uh, it's a very interesting approach to saying, you know, to, to cultural destabilization as a yeah. geopolitical tactic. And yeah, so I'm, I'm, there's I'll put a, some references into the, there's a very some, early there's a very early one that was very uh, that ha, that unpacked it in a much deeper way than what I've seen recently. So I'm looking for that. Yeah, there was so a I defector. Was probably, like, go ahead. There was, there was a defector that uh, recently so unpacked this, and I forgot where I saw it, but he basically uh, was saying that um, this has been like a 20, 30 year campaign to destabilize. The United States on a generational level, meaning they are interfering uh, uh, at a generational level to have a a wave of of people come up with completely different ways of understanding how the world works, um, and and so long range, deep seated, actually truly an act of war. Right? When you when you wrap it up here, very so very we're... very sophisticated, and we probably need to go back and look to what's the name Durchin, uh, Putin's whisperer. Yeah. Uh, yes. Peter uh, Paul Redseff has done the best books on this. He has a new one coming out next month, I think, called How to Win an Information War. So we're still in the hunt for a topic. And I, I'm i not going to resist the temptation to say that uh, Adam Curtis's documentary Hypernormalization from 2016 convinced me that we are already in a nonlinear war, which is the name that is often given to the thing you described, Gil. Um, and, and it's important to call it that, Jerry, because, you know, a lot of people say, why don't we charge Trump and his guys with treason? But you can't charge treason without a declared enemy. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You need a declared enemy to have treason. Otherwise, it's so, so if, that... if you sold American secrets to somebody who wasn't a declared enemy, that's the enemy. That's not treason. It's that's, espionage. That seems ridiculous. I, I I I may be wrong, but that's my understanding of it. That's correct, uh, Gil. You're right. It's you need the war context and frame to to give rise to the legal definition of treason. Cool. I did not know that. Thank you. So so it raises the question of if we in fact are at war with Russia in an information war, but it's not declared. Uh, what are the values or unvalues of declare of declaring it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I have no idea. Thank you. Uh, Patty, then Pete, then Stacey. Um, this might be stepping back a couple steps from, from when I waved my hand. Um, and maybe we could, uh, Jared, to your point, um, we're still looking for a topic. I'd be inclined to to suggest that we keep riffing on the misinformation topic. To, that's, to what, that's what feels like it's, is happening here. So I'm, I'm that's where I'm heading. But OK. Um, so yeah, just to, um, after Doug's share, it made me think of um, the question Mike opened with, which was, uh, one, it's, and I might be um, not repeating it exactly how you said it, Mike, but it sounded like the question you were asking was how can we engage with with those who are, or combat those who are um, uh, positing misinformation? Does that sound close, Mike, to what? It's more than just our individual efforts, although, that concern, concerns me most because my father and my brother are both victims of Fox News. But I think there's also society-wide efforts that we could tell our politicians to support. So, so Finland has a world-class effort to fight disinformation that starts in the second or third grade. They actually teach critical thinking skills, but they also teach them teach the kids, you know, this is what somebody does when they want to deceive you. This is what somebody does when they think you're stupid. Um, so that that's 
another way to do it. But yeah, you've you've captured my essence, and I'm glad you're interested in talking about this. The 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 fact is we all focus on filtering out the stuff, but we really need to focus on how people react to the stuff because it's going to get through, and people are going to share it by word of mouth. So, thank you. Though. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for clarifying. Um, I'm inclined to agree with with what Doug shared, and that there there uh, might need to be a different um, level at which we are entering uh, the problem that isn't um, the the downstream. What to me would seem like the downstream expression of um, meeting force with force. And I think that there, I, anybody, I don't know what that looks like, but I'm I'm inclined to think that the you know open like open combat or direct combat of the disinformation um at the level of those dissemin disseminating disseminating the, the disinformation wouldn't be um productive i don't know what the alternative looks like um but i don't think that that's the level of engagement that would be sustainable or productive it's my first impressions thanks patty uh pete and stacy and feel free to take a moment take a beat before stepping in so we can slow the slow the mixer Um, I'm, I'm with Patty, the, you know, it seems like the topic has kind of gelled in, into one and I like it. I, I don't like that it exists, but I like that we're talking about it. Um, uh, I wanted to add, um, uh, I want to add more complexity, uh, to our thinking about, uh, cyber warfare and disinformation and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and I have a weird data point from yesterday, actually. Um, uh, it was an article in TechCrunch, and I'll, I'll uh, paste it here. Um, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Uh, recently, you know, in the past week or so, um, Mastodon got uh, seriously, uh, seriously disrupted um, by spam. Um, and... Uh, this this is partly due to the the design of Mastodon as a decentralized uh, social media platform that doesn't have a lot of control over um, uh, a lot of control over like stopping spam. Um, I I think it's it's a I from my point of view it's actually kind of a design deficiency. Um, it's not that a decentralized platform uh, needs to have poor spam control. It's that Mastodon grew up in a earlier and uh, more naive time when <laughs> it didn't seem like it would happen or something, I don't know. Anyway, um, that's kind of a side note to uh, figuring out why, why it got disrupted by spam. It could have been that uh, disinformation experts were, were taking over. It looks a lot more like it was two teenagers uh, having a feud uh, in Japan um, and um, just getting bigger and bigger waves of like, um, stuff thrown at each other uh, caused Mastodon to kind of fall over. Um, so in that article, uh, a cybersecurity expert uh, says something really interesting to me. Um, uh, he's, he says, this reminds me back in 2016, um, uh, Reddit and Spotify and big chunks of the internet fell down um, because of a botnet swarm. Um, and uh, this was bigger than the current Mastodon one. Uh, and so he's, he tells the story, like I went on NPR and had to explain what was going on. And, and the question was, well, this must be Putin, right? And he's like, it's a bunch of kids, it's teenagers. Um, it wasn't actually Putin. So the, that's, that's kind of a touchstone for me. Um, it's easy to go, oh my God, disinformation, Trump won, whatever, and it must be Putin. Um, I am certain that a large, in large part, um, Putin and whatever you know minions he has in in Russia, like com continually try to disrupt our our culture, American culture, um, and of course, um, Americans, uh, the American um, information systems do the same thing around the world too, right? So. Um, so I want to kind of caution maybe, uh, it's, it's easy to go, oh, okay, the, the problem is that Putin uh, lives in the Kremlin someplace and is causing all of this. It's a lot more complicated than that. Um, it's, a, it's a multifaceted side, it's a multifaceted thing, multi, multilateral thing. Uh, we do it, um, lots of people do it, and, um, and 
it's not necessarily always uh, on purpose. Sometimes it's just kids playing uh, on the internet now, uh, oddly enough. Um, I think <clears throat> the, the thing that I worry about is that <clears throat> I can tell there are like massive cultural disruption um, uh, forces going on in the US fighting information wars or, or, or stuff. And I don't. I I think the folks behind him are really rich people who are kind of multi-homed around the country, around the world. I don't think they're necessarily Americans, but I don't think they're necessarily Putin either. And I think most of us aren't even aware of it. Um, so I think big chunks of uh, American culture get swung around um, by shadowy forces. Um, that you know, it 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 seems like. Wow, Putin must be really shadowy to affect, you know, the 2016 election or something like that. Um, I think it gets a lot more shadowy than that, and a lot bigger, and 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 affects us much more deeply. So I'm not trying to minimize um, the fact that Russia does that kind of stuff, but I am trying to add that it's a, you know, that's the tip of a very large and and um, and deep culturally affecting uh, iceberg. Thanks. Just to complexify Pete's complexification a little bit more, does anybody consider advertising propaganda? Or propaganda advertising. Or propaganda advertising. And what is the business model of several, maybe a third of the world's largest corporations? advertising. Uh, Doug, then Gil. And I think we are narrowing down onto the disinformation, misinformation topic. Uh, so I'll just say that. Go ahead. So just to respond to Pete and then my point, um, QAnon was a gaming community that um, escaped the box and was unleashed into the wild like and that's the source of rights insanity you know good good chunk of the source of the rights insanity um the point i wanted to make in in alignment with my previous um inquiry is the question is less about for me the fact of all of this going on as it is, what is it that's missing that's making people vulnerable to it? And that drops down into much more fundamental pieces like safety, identity, that is internally centered, individual by individual, or on a mass societal level, why is there the absence of that? The absence of values, the absence of morality, the absence of ethics, the absence of sensed, internal sense knowing what's right from wrong, what's true, what's false, all of that. The underlying uh, intrinsic ability to do that is instantiated in every in every human being. I absolutely believe that. The question is why have so many people lost themselves and lost those faculties? And I think that's the inquiry isn't about how do you stop all the stuff that's keeping them lost. It's how do you provide them with what they need to return to rationality, return to judgment, and return to discernment. And that's about needs as opposed to addressing the symptoms. And I'm complete. Uh, Doug, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to take a stab, I'm going to open a bit of a can of worms by trying to take a, a brief answer at that, which is that allegedly, presumably, that's the role of religion, right? To give people meaning and a source of an anchor and a foundation and faith. And I think that religions have failed to do that largely. And what's happening is nuns are as the largest category in the U.S., uh, religious category. The U.S. is surprisingly religious, 
<clears throat> but the grow the growing category right now is nuns, people who are spiritual but not religious, or not are, are they're, they're leaving organized religion, uh, not in droves but but considerably. The shift is pretty pretty sharp, and then we have a general loss of trust in other institutions like the government and the intentional undermining of trust in other institutions. Uh, go go watch hypernormalization, uh, and the result is people unmoored, and then all it takes is a plot thread to float in front of you that attaches itself to something like you're worried about your child and the MMP vaccine they're supposed to take. MMR? MMP? Uh, mumps? Uh, forgetting what that is. Uh, and all of a sudden you're in QAnon because you're a worried mom and, and there's people out there saying, yes, yes, the vaccines are dangerous and you're down the rabbit hole. Um, and so people are, I think, grasping, grasping a lot for what and why. And Doug, I think you put your finger on a really important uh, force in this whole question. What 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 predisposes us to be accepting of alternate narratives that are uh, particularly, in many cases, particularly dangerous? Uh, thank you. MMR, measles, rubella, measles, mumps, and rubella, I think. Yeah. Gil, Gil could I just respond to that for a second? I, it won't be long. Western religion actually was the the beginning of um, telling people you are not the center of your safety and stability. You need me to make it safe for you. So I call that the golden idol syndrome. You mean specifically <laughs> specifically Abrahamic religions is what you're pointing Correct. Out? Absolutely. Yep. So yeah. All, all, all organized religion was the earliest manifestation of you need me to tell you how to be safe and what to do and what you need and what you don't need. And, and it, it, it was a, um, a replacement of individual grounding in space and centering, a, a surrogacy. That's actually the inception of, you know, the source, the root of, of how we ended up where we are today. Now, everything is golden idled. Even somebody, you know, hawking some magic pill or cure or black box on the internet for corporations or for this or for that or for whatever. The truth of the matter is, you know, I can't make sense unless I'm certified in theory you. What the hell is that? So it's it's everything is distorted in this golden idol way. And 99% of it all is not in service to the people that end up getting drawn or sucked in. Doesn't mean there may be not some intrinsic value in the initial insights, but the minute it became associated with idol and brand and certification or right and wrong and validation or leadership or whatever, uh, the ship is, it's playing the old paradigm forward, but it's the golden idol syndrome run, run wild because people do not believe they are capable of being their own, their own orientation, their own North star, their own center of, of reference. And that the the whole system has been set up to say, you're not, you can't, you're not able, you're not qualified, or you're not good enough, or you're whatever. Sorry, little rant, Gil. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, more than a little rant, Doug. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I get where you're going. I think I get where you're coming from. And I have a substantially different interpretation of history than you do. Uh, on this, which is probably a topic for another time. Uh, but I will say that there were plenty of golden idols before the Abrahamic traditions arose. Uh, and in fact, the first of the Abrahamic traditions was a very explicit rebellion against golden idols. Where it went since then is another story. But anyhow, so that's, let's flag, tag that, maybe just you and me, maybe the group to come back to that one another time. I, I see it very differently than you do. Um, the um, the Abrahamic tradition that I pertain to says you need us as a fundamental thing that it says we this says we need we so anyhow 
story for another time, but back to the disinformation story. Um, um, and I'm, I like that we're on this topic. There's a lot here. Um, yes, I think it was Pete who said um, that this is, we're not just dealing with explicit intentional actions by particular actors, but we're dealing with the emergent properties of rapidly evolving complex systems that we don't know how they, all the ways in which they work. Um, and, um, you know, and so you know, are they vulnerable to teenagers in Japan? Yeah. Are they vulnerable to software glitches? I mean, OpenAI went cuckoo a couple of nights ago. Um, so, you know, there's uh, the, um, even with explicit computer code, we know, you know, we know the code is so complex that you can't possibly trap all bugs before you release it. How much more so with AI, where we don't know exactly what's going on inside that thing. Uh, and we don't know what explicitly is going on inside this thing either. So there's that. Um, um, a few threads. Um, one is the, the um, John Robb has done a lot of work on what he calls asymmetric warfare. Um, um, Global Guerrillas is one of the brands he uses, John Robb, R-O-B-B, former Air Force pilot, software executive, et cetera. Um, comes from a more right of the political spectrum perspective than I do, but very important and valuable work. And he's one of the people who's really drilled into that game um, uh, substantially. Um, the um, Jerry, you and others have said that uh, we do this too. We all do this. We are outraged when we find Russian spies, but of course there are American spies all over the world. And we're outraged at foreign influence in our elections, but we've mastered the game of influencing elections around the world for decades. Um, um, it would be it would be worthwhile in this conversation at some point to look at the writings of Edward Bernays. Um, um, and the writings of Herr Goebbels um, and other people who've been very explicit about how to use, and, and Mao for that matter, and Lenin and others who've been very explicit about how to use these tools. And um, 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 Justice Powell, uh, Supreme Court Justice, who many of you know wrote the Powell Memorandum in the early 1970s under commission by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to shift the perception and power of business in American society. Uh, and a lot of what we've seen over the past several decades um, uh, is not so much random events as it is a playing out of the strategy laid out 50 years ago. Um, a terrific resource on that is a film called Heist. Um, there are several films called Heist. This one is subtitled The Stealing of the American Dream, uh, which lays out that story. And the last thing I'll say here, no, maybe not the last thing. I think the, the, the Finland example is really important. The training in dealing with this information as part of a very sophisticated edu educational system, really highly revered in the world. Finland pays their teachers well and invests seriously in education. And we're kind of we're in a mirror image of what we do here. Um, um, where was I going with that? The, um, we have a very profound challenge in this country because of our commitment to free speech which I'm committed to and think is deeply important, but it it complicates this game for us a lot. In Canada, you're not allowed to lie on the news. It's against the law. Here it's not. And here it can't be. Uh, and the overlaps of that with cancel culture uh, or whatever you want to call that game on both the left and the right um, um, is a whole other kind of information warfare that I'm frankly deeply concerned about. Um, um, and it's having the effect in some circles of, of flattening and dumbing down the public debate and discussion and exploration of what we can find together. Um, so uh, that's enough. I'll just leave it there for now. Thanks, Gil. This is indeed a rich mother load of, of stuff. Stacy, please. Yeah, so I kept putting I kept putting my hand up and down because I didn't think I could connect all the dots, but I want to go back to what Doug was saying, because for those of us that believe that we have to learn to do ourselves better, um, I think what Doug was, uh, so I agree with what Doug was saying. And where I come from is the belief that the role that the church played in the way that he described 
which I think is accurate, is that learning communities can do that. So for me, experiencing is the midway point between being and doing. And learning communities provide that experience. So as an example, when Gil says in Canada, you can't lie on the news, that's the kind of question that if brought up in a learning community and every person was like talking about it, sort of like, well, let me not go on, off on a tangent. That's a way that in a group where you kind of know each other, maybe not that well or different pieces, you can just get a sense of how people feel about different things. But so some of you know that I'm in North Carolina living with someone that I am so, so close to who was for a very long time, a devout MAGA. <laughs> she's still a devout Catholic. And we have, she's not voting this time. She's absolute, she, right now she's not voting, which is a plus we're getting, we're getting somewhere. But we were driving in the car yesterday and, you know, I said, you know, I'm only poking at you because she was like, I, I know, I know, I know. And then she started to say, but it was, it, she was feeling overwhelmed that how are we going to fix this? Because I started, I finally got her to listen to some stuff about how like MAGAs have infiltrated the evangelical movement, things like that. I know her and because I know her, I know that my way into her belief system is through a, a consciousness kind of, you know, and that's the other thing I wanted to say. You have to speak to people from their belief system, not change their belief system, go in there. Um, but anyway, so I was, we were talking about whatever. And at one point she just felt very overwhelmed, like, but we're never gonna get them. How are we gonna, and I looked at her and I said, we're all we have. And she just gasped and she was like, oh, yes, I get it. So anyway, um, I just think, I, again, because, I mean, I come to this group because I really feel that the power we have is in creating learning communities. And I want to just emphasize the importance of the experience of that. And Jose, this is basically for you. I was gonna share this tomorrow because like you took us through a process. And what I didn't share with you is that for me, the most important part of that process is that everybody's contributing something about themselves, not what they do, but a piece of who they are. And that I think fills in some of the gap of what Doug was saying people are missing. I'm pretty complete. <laughs> that was great. Right. Thank you. Um, thanks, Stacey. Uh, Pete. Uh, I wanted to thank Doug B for, for bringing up QAnon um, because maybe it's a, a thing that we can kind of examine at, uh, at arm's length now. Um, it was horrible and disgusting um, and, and it's over, hopefully more or less. Um, uh, I think one of the things for me when I look at, at what happened with QAnon is not so much where it started or how it started, but that it spread. So it's, it was an instance of social contagion, largely, that let it get big. It wasn't the fact that it was, you know, a gaming community or 4chan or whatever it was. Um, so I think it's important, it's, you know, so maybe if we had Finlandized uh, the U.S. over the past 30 or 40 years uh, so that social contagions, uh, sociopathic social contagions like that, would dampen themselves out rather than um, inflame people and uh, have people jump on the bandwagon because it serves their their personal interests and their excitement and their ability to beat up other people or whatever. Um, you know, maybe the world would be a different place. So I I think I so I I really want to stress that um, there's there's kind of a root cause here, which which um, uh, which underpins a lot of these kinds of situations. Um, it's it's that we're weak and flabby as a society and as a culture, 
it's not that we get poked once in a while. Um, the poke isn't the the real problem. The, the poke is, or sorry, the, the real problem is the fact that we've got laxity in our ability as a, a society to withstand, um, uh, you know, perturbations, whether they're by accident, whether they're a bunch of teenagers having you know, a laugh, whether it's Putin, whether it's whatever. I, another thing I, I, I re, re, feel like I kind of reread some of the QAnon stuff. Um, I would be shocked uh, if QAnon wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, deliberately engineered uh, to, be, to be what it is. So it's easy to say, oh my God, uh, 4chan is horrible and it's the source of all evil. And if only we, I, you know, <laughs> um, somebody paid a few 4chan people um, or convinced them maybe without even paying them to do things and then kept feeding that fire. Um, so we never found and, and convicted, you know, we found and, and convicted kind of uh, the idea of 4chan. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, went, well, I guess we're done here. That's, that was that problem. There was somebody else driving that thing, I think. Uh, and uh, it was just too, too cleverly done and affected too much of the population to have been just a, a, a random, you know, random act of violence. Okay. So I, I hope we can do a better job as a society learning to be more resistant to social contagion, um, especially the sociopathic kind, rather than, you know, rather than just assume that it's all over now that it's over. And two quick things before I go to Mike and Klaus. Hold on, Mike, just, just a sec. Uh, one is I put a post a little earlier in the chat uh, to the essay by, to the, the thought is QAnon and ARG. There's a really good essay uh, by Adrian Hahn. ARG is alternate reality game. And, and basically it's a big, if you look at it as a LARP, as a big live action role play or an alternate reality game, a lot of things become clear because there's a game master who's dropping clues, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, wow, how do you run a whole bunch of people as if it were a game? It just, the framing works really, really well. And then uh, the second thing I wanted to go to is, I just want to pull on one thread that's come up a bunch here, especially in the chat. We were talking about the Finnish uh, education system, and I put in some links about folk high schools back when and Bildung. One of the answers that we hear a lot is, oh, let's just fix the schools. Let's just educate everybody. I think that might be a dead end for a couple of reasons. One is we're fighting over the schools right now. It's a, it's a, it's a knife fight in an elevator with people who are trying to get rid of, uh, you know, basically because we have compulsory education and we have school boards and all of those things sort of corral up to choke points, we have this knife fight in an elevator to try to figure out how to influence that. I think the answer, and, and I have a huge critique of the compulsory education system, watch my TEDx talk. Um, so I'm wondering how we get better critical thinking from the ground up in a fractal, completely distributed way through actions, through th doing things together that improve our communities, et cetera, et cetera. How do we work better thinking into that thing rather than trying to reform the institutions and train, ev train everybody better to be critical thinkers, which last I checked fails often. Uh, and it seems to be rare in the world that we get an educational system that pulls that one off really well. So. And that's kind of where my thoughts on that are. Uh, Mike, then Klaus. Thanks. Uh, you helped answer some of the things that I wanted to frame some of the questions I wanted to ask because uh, Paul, Pete, Pete I, 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 I don't see where you're saying that QAnon is over. I mean, there isn't such a stream of stuff tracked back to QAnon, but the damage has been done, you know, 20, 30 million people seem to believe some of the core tenets of the QAnon worldview. That there's a bunch of pedophile Democrats who are trying to build global government. And I, I, I fully agree that there's a lot of effort going into perpetuating this. And it's a, it's a massive psychological operation, a PSYOP. The irony, though, is that that phrase is being used by uh, Fox News, OANN, some of the crazies on the MAGA fringe, they're describing what the Justice Department is doing as a PSYOP, when the fact is, is that Putin and his pals are doing things like QAnon and um, all this new revelation about a 
FBI informant who was working directly with the Russian spy agency. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, I, 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 I think we have to figure out a multi-pronged approach to things like QAnon, including figuring out who's been pushing it. I mean, I have to believe that the U.S. intelligence community has some pretty good ideas of where, where some of these things are, are happening. And I, I, I don't know why we haven't seen detailed information on where the hubs are, where, where are these people sending all this material from? I, I, it, it just boggles my mind. But the most important is what Jerry said. You know, let's let's get the entire society talking about this stuff and thinking hard about what's truth and what's not. Starting with the kids is really important, but I think the biggest problem here is people who have retired and in some cases are starting to think less critically, be more trusting or be more fearful or both. And I, I don't know how we reach them other than having their grandkids say, Grandma, you, you know that QAnon isn't real. I, 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 I think there's got to be just a, a multi-generational and uh, multi-dimensional, multi-disciplinary approach here. And we're not, we're not doing it, partly because every time the, the Biden administration tries to do something against disinformation, the other side yells, Thought police, censorship. I mean, it's astonishing to me that the House of Representatives has defunded a number of these State Department initiatives that were aimed at stopping the spread of dis disinformation overseas, where it was crippling our di diplomatic efforts. I mean, my, my wife was our ambassador to Cyprus, which is a beautiful place in a very dangerous neighborhood. Lots of Russian money, lots of Russian oligarchs, or at least the mistresses of Russian oligarchs. It's incredibly sophisticated what they're doing there. There are Russians who own radio stations broadcasting in Russian, as well as Greek. So anyway, harangue, harangue. Harangue away. I, I do think that one of the big mechanisms here is doing more of what Stacy does, and which it means visiting friends, taking them by the hand, uh, having heartfelt conversations, approaching them from where they are within their belief system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, if many people undertake things like that, that causes large scale change. If only a few people do that, doesn't cause enough change. Uh, Klaus and Patty. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to throw in a consideration um, on a time scale, um, I love this letter from uh, Tolstoy, you know, a letter to a Hindu that was actually uh, created the foundation for Mahatma Gandhi's mission uh, and the way he approached uh, his his life. Um, I mean, we, we just have to recognize that this is an inherent quality of our species. You know, this is innately, deeply embedded in our culture, just like there's no reason why somebody would use a club and uh, hit somebody over the head to take away what he has, what he carries, right? This is this is just part of, of the story. Um, so you can go all the way back, like uh, Tolstoy does in this letter, all the way back to as far uh, as, uh, as our recorded history will, will let us travel, and then you go to science fiction and you go forward and it's the same story. There's not one science fiction writer who can envision a future that is not tainted with all the same uh, pathologies that we have uh, today, you know, and that we have had historically. So obviously um, this is, this is um, a trait in our psyche, in our way of being that has to be framed in by culture. Yeah, so we, we have to have uh, agreement that uh, this is the way we conduct ourselves. But the temptation to use this propaganda tool, uh, whether through religion or in which or QAnon or in whichever way it is uh, expressed, is just too great because it provides such a powerful tool to use. So so the it 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 has to be made. Um, the wrong thing to do. It has to be 
the uh, polite society doesn't do that sort of thing uh, uh, kind of uh, approach. Um, and if we were to cement it in right now, let's say we uh, collectively, we here succeed in um, having the political process express disdain, educate the population you know, on the uh, risk and the danger of doing this, and then we, we get it all cleaned up within two, three generations, we'd be right back to, you know, somebody figured out I can do this and it gives me advantage. I mean, that's at least where, where science fiction is going. You know, it's basically saying it's inevitable that something will kick off this familiar race to the bottom once again. You know? So I, I think we just philosophically uh, accept this is what it is. It's part of who we are. It's part of our psyche. And so how do you rein it in? How do you how do you put a, a fence post around it you know, so it stays contained? Um, thanks, Klaus. Uh, one of the things you said reminded me of an essay I just read. Ted Joya is a really good and prolific writer on the business of music and music itself and a bunch of other things. And he wrote this essay where he's talking about how entertainment ate art and now distraction is eating entertainment. And all of that is what we have as our cultural base to work with to try to answer the questions that you were just talking about. So some piece of art is working on principles and other sorts of things that, that att attach to the soul and to the heart, as opposed to just the brain uh, and the senses. And we're, we're losing that. It's being swallowed by a, a device that just wants the endless scroll of short bursts of something that keeps your attention and sort of this the addiction doom loop uh, that we seem to be in. And I'm kind of overgeneralizing, but I'm kind of not. When you look at the stats on TikTok, for example, uh, that the amount of time young people are spending on TikTok is astonishing. Um, and so if we want some culture or if we want some critical thinking or if we want other kinds of things, we're going to have to, in some sense, wrestle it away by winning the war with TikTok. Through TikTok? I don't know. Um, Patty. Mm. Just a couple observations as um as the conversation's unfolding and I'm I'm kind of watching how we're talking about information. What what's occurring to me is that if um if the issue that we're we're discussing is uh happening at the level of myths or disinformation, and our our, our best ammunition seems to be um you know, discourse of narratives that are more truthful or, you know, more accurate, truthful or more accurate representation of uh, reality. It kind of sounds like even, even the, um, when we're able to package that in a way that that can be shared and in a way that that seems to resonate with others and we can, you know, do it whatever we can to get a better discourse or a more accurate or truthful discourse out there. It seems like even that can, can be quickly weaponized and used and kind of like redirected and pointed back in our direction. So the so what's coming to me is I wonder if um, back to what Doug had shared earlier in the you know the chat that the level of intervention for for this at this um, this this pool of issues might not be at the level of countering with like more accurate or truthful information it has to be at maybe a different level and then it also occurred to me that it, it kind of seems like I was thinking of what Stacy was sharing about the experience you have with your friend and it almost seems like there, there's a threshold beyond which um, if if an idea passes it and it is able to reach a certain amount of people, then it can become weaponized. So it almost seems like there's there's some wisdom, at, and, and I know Jerry echoed this, at trying to um, maneuver through this and navigate this this issue at, at, at a much more um, at a much more micro level, community level. Um, I think what something that occurred to me earlier in the conversation was maybe the um, what that could look like is um, the revitalizing of third spaces and community and having um, smaller pockets of discourse that feel more safe and feel less charged and like there, there's less at stake and less at risk in the in the discourse that it's being had. Um, Patty, thank you. You made me connect a couple of things, some of what you said. Uh, I wrote, reality is more boring than fantasy or rage. And I just want to elaborate on that for a second. The work of being citizens with each other, the, the boring work of making sense of the world, of improving our neighborhoods, all that is actually sort of boring unless you really love it, in which case it's fantastic. But compared to the crazy ass 
narratives of QAnon or conspiracy theories that are being floated. Taylor Swift is a psyop. You know, she's being paid by NATO to like, wait, what? Well, those things are actually fun and exciting. And you can read to their very retellable stories in Jay Golden's language of storytelling. Um, they're really good. And then rage is another great weapon. And the far right magas have really, really figured out rage. There's a thought in my brain of Democrats are finally getting pissed off about stuff. And I collect up video clips of different Democrats in different places who are actually um, justifiably enraged and are letting letting the microphone have it or, or whoever they're speaking to have it that way. But the far right has figured out how to do this. I remember during the Kavanaugh hearings when you know we were seeing whether he was going to become a... Um, uh, thanks, Doug. Um, whether Kavanaugh was going to become a, a Supreme Court justice, um, Lindsey Graham comes out and he is a master actor. He goes into his a patented outrage cycle where he is incensed and livid. And wow, he is just cashing in the chips right there. Because uh, in, in fact, when Kavanaugh himself does uh, his testimony, which was so beautifully, beautifully parodied by Matt Damon. I have to say, Matt Damon doing uh, Ka Brett Kavanaugh was just a master stroke of, of humor, unfortunately, because then it just made it funny instead of dangerous. Um, but when Kavanaugh comes out and gets really mad, I was like, the first thing I thought was like, oh, okay, so Kavanaugh has given up on joining the Supreme Court, and he is just going to like cry and blame people now. And I was wrong. I was really wrong. That was read as righteous outrage. And uh, there were all other politics involved, but he managed to get on the Supreme Court. Uh, so I just, this little equation, that scares me a lot, that reality is more boring than fantasy or rage. And I think it's important that we remember that and and maybe try to, I, I, I say this facetiously, but I'm trying to figure out what are the strategies, hide the broccoli. You know, when kids don't want to eat their broccoli, you turn it into funny stuff, you make a game out of it, you do whatever. Uh, a friend of mine uh, wanted to feed his kids uh, carrot souffle. And he said, my kids are never going to eat carrot souffle. So he said to them, "What do you, do you know what's for dinner tonight? Carrot ice cream. And they were like, ice cream? We like ice cream. Yeah. It's going to be hot, though. It's not going to be cold. But but it's going to be carrot ice cream. He sold it to them as ice cream. And and. I, that's sort of lying or, or covering things. So I don't think that's the way to do reality well, but can we make reality more engaging, more loving, more interesting, more connective? And I think the connective part of the boring task of community and building and civic life is actually the stuff that we're missing that Doug was pointing to earlier. I think that is a really big piece of what we're missing. And I blame consumerism and individualism and all those things for separating us from one another and de deprecating all that work of being citizens together on the planet. Patty, then Stacy. Mm, man, love the love the analogy of hiding the broccoli. And I, I presenced it in the chat, but I also think this is kind of important to, to sit on for a second. Uh, has anyone seen Ted Lasso here? Yeah, it, it, it was it was brilliant, right? It was you know it was it was so so many moments and pockets of um, just a different an alternative way of navigating in the world being modeled for and in my experience was the first time I had seen anything like that modeled in, in popular media and it has been in the top three top four on Apple TV ever since it, it you know showcased what was that four years ago now you know even though the, the season ended um the third season ended I think it was just this last year like it is it is it is still alive in the hearts of many myself included because we are thirsty for something else we are thirsty for a different way that's I say we um many you know not all but I think there are there are many who are aware or or have a sense even if they don't know it that there's there's a different way of doing it and and we just need to see it modeled and we just need to see it um celebrated and highlighted kind of like I feel what happened with Ted Lasso um part of what Jerry was sharing um brought me back to what Doug had initially suggested when Doug was saying that like we're missing we we collectively may be missing this deeper fundamental piece what about the ability to feel right I, I think that there are so many different ways in which feeling is being leveraged against what I would, you know, suppose is a very numb and very um, disconnected society. I think that the ability to feel things like joy and delight and pleasure and curiosity and wonder is a human need. And I think that that isn't a conversation that I hear being um, talked of very often. I don't think that there's common shared language for that or even a recognition of that. And I, I think as a consequence, 
So many of us are being left to pursue things like true crime or, you know, really um, heavy shock value media in, in an attempt just, just to feel something. And so I think that another um, gap that the way that political discourse and news is being um, sent uh, or shoved, you know, or shoved down our throats or, or being sent to us is that it is, it is filling this need we have to feel something. But unfortunately, I think often the outrage um, and the disgust and the self-righteousness uh, can fill this gap we don't know many many don't know that they have of feeling things that are different and it is it is serving um serving a need for many in that way unfortunately that's just my take on it thanks Pat. um stacy yeah i was just gonna say real quickly since you brought up anger that that was one of the ways that i made a lot of headway with my friend is just getting like sometimes we would just focus on the energy of of somebody we wouldn't even like listen to what they were saying and sometimes it was people that we didn't even know just so that i could get her to see, because she is a very feeling and sensing person and i i basically just taught her ways to see whether somebody's message was authentic or was whether it was trying to be manipulative regardless of what their opinion was or what they were trying to say so I just taught her the skills, which I think is important because I know I don't learn unless I experience it myself. You know, a whole bunch of people could tell me something. It might sway me. I might keep trying because I'm still not seeing it. But in the end, I'm not going to get it until I get it. And I think there's a lot of people like that. I don't think it's just me. Thanks, Stacey. Let's... Um... Just take a moment and go into silence for a bit. We've said a lot in an hour and a quarter. Um, I'll bring us back out in, in a moment. And love the Diamond Dogs reference in the chat. Thank you very much. Where are two now? I will remind everybody that uh, the, the second of four governance calls is coming up uh, at 10, so 45 minutes from now, same Zoom. If you'd like to join, please bring people that don't look, out, don't look like us to the call. Um, us. So, so the, the place where, where I'm at with this is that the only way through is just radical transparency. Um, I was listening to yesterday, actually, uh, to uh, a couple talking heads on uh, on a YouTube channel, and they were naming uh, Jordan Johnson, I mean, specific members of Congress as liars. I mean, they're saying these guys are deliberately lying to the American public. They are repeating Russian propaganda. They are actually harming you know, our discourse in our society. And so you would, the, the, the idea of being polite about this or um, avoiding a skirmish should have passed by now. And for the Biden administration, it would be time to take the gloves off, right? And, and to just outright say that. 
say this is a lie. You're you're perpetuating you know a lie that originated at the KGB, and just just make these shocking statements because um, the, the any way of circumscribing things or being polite about things were way beyond this. You know, it it's uh, it's. Uh, it's not it's not going to have the the effect so and with an understanding of this is this is a war right i mean the, the real consequences of losing this are as severe as having a shooting war you know where you blow up each other's buildings because the impact on our economy right the impact on our tax system and our laws and everything is enormous you know and what's at stake here is just absolutely incredible not even to talk about uh, having this collective need to prepare for an impending climate environment that uh, is going to call, to throw enormous challenges at us, which we're completely unprepared to deal with, right? So, so it's not just this immediate political scenario. The much bigger thing looming out there is that the environment has reached tipping points that could just dramatically alter. Uh, the way our our civilizations function, so I see that really from from this point of you know at some point in time, you know you have to take this the safety off and 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 go for it. Thanks, Thomas. And I'm I'm very torn about whether you should meet anger with anger or not. That that's really really hard for me. Uh, and, not and anger. I'm not talking about anger. You know, I mean, you you don't have to be angry to defend yourself in a in a war. Yes. You know, you just have to be conscious of your own safety and and that of your children, your family. Thanks, Klaus. Um, go ahead, Patty. Um, maybe a bit unrelated to to what Klaus was sharing. This is I just wanted to present something that I've been uh, working on for a while. It's it's not um it's not complete by any stretch, but I, I'm curious to be interested to develop it with others, but I've been um, trying to track this, uh, you know, the, the conversation we're having to me points to, or invites me into the question of like, what's the most, you know, can we find the most upstream um, iteration of what is causing all of this, you know, chaos that we're, that we're, we're exploring together. And I, um, I've been considering the possibility of um, whatever, the, whatever personal power or power actually means this thing that, that tends to elude, um, quantification and um, clear definitions and language. I'm curious of um, around how power might act as almost like a homeostatic function within um, a single body and um, how power transfer may be occurring between two people. Um, they're not aware because this thing is actually um, fundamentally necessary for uh, a human survival. And are we witnessing um, power transfer among and between humans at the collective level um, that that may just be a reflection of a deep, uh, I think it, it got alluded to earlier in the conversation, um, kind of a systematic, potentially some systematic disempowerment of the collective. And now are we seeing power rippling and transferring between people in the way that it is today as a manifestation of that? So that's a conversation I would uh, love to have with others. Um, so please let me know. Uh, seconding Mike, humor is a huge, powerful tool. I didn't see, I didn't see that, but I, I agree with Mike hundred percent. I think that going back to what Jerry was saying, hiding the broccoli in um, packages of humor and uh, wholesomeness and not snark and not uh, um, degradation might be a really powerful tool going forward. So anyway, reach out please if you're interested in having that conversation together because yeah, I'd like to have it with others. Um, a couple things. Uh, one, I, I rude, um Many years ago, maybe in the middle of the Trump administration, I read the fact that our best journalists were comedians um, and how like the best critiques of the news were happening from the top comedians in the country. And I was like, journalism seems to have dropped the ball. Don't know exactly what's happening. Uh, Patty, if, uh, if there's concurrence, maybe, uh, I think the notion of power might make a great topic two weeks from now uh, on our next topic call. Uh, we'll see if there's energy around that, but I'll, I'll put it down as a, as a placeholder. Uh, for two weeks from now. And um, yeah, uh, off to you, Gil. Uh, there we go. Yeah, takes a minute for the fingers to get there. 
Um, I was surprised, Jerry, by your comment about anger. And so we had this little exchange in the chat. I asked Jerry, for people who didn't see it, what do you do in the dojo? Where you learn very early on that anger is just not helpful. Um, anger constrains your ability to respond. Um, anger, you know, in, in, anger limits my freedom. Anger hurts me in some ways more than it hurts the other guy. And this is an embodied practice, not a theoretical one. So it's actually a very interesting place to play from. And and I raise it because it's part of the challenge is bringing that dojo experience out into the real life of messiness and humans and arguments and you know road rage and politics and all that stuff. But it's instructive for us. Um, but the other thought that comes up here is that um, is that rage is different than anger. Um, indignation is different than anger. Um, ig indignation, of course, I mean, it's right there in the word is tied to dignity. Um, and indignation is kind of a, is a, is a, um, sorry, running out of words here this morning. Um, it's a, it's, re it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a reaction to an assault on dignity. And that's a very different kind of anger. Or different than what we usually think of as anger. So there's there's room for something here other than just calm and passive acceptance and such. Um, and there's and there's a place to fight. And it's a question of how do we fight? Who do we fight? How do we fight? And so forth. So uh, it's a that's another interesting thread for us to go down. I and Jerry, I posted in the chat. Um, I followed your link to the TED talk that you mentioned and on the sidebar is something of the complexities of the martial artist's mindset, which I haven't seen. I suspect might have something interesting for us. Sweet, thank you. Um, I will tell the I will tell the first story of that TEDx talk real quick here. Uh, there's an Aikido practitioner in ter named Terry Dobson who is not the speaker in this thing, and uh, was my first who was my very first teacher. No way, that's awesome. I have stories to tell you about them, but go ahead. So, go on. Tell me if this is one of Terry's stories. Uh, he tells the story of how Terry was learning. He was getting going up the ranks in Aikido and wanted to sort of try it out because uh, in Aikido, we don't do open combat. We do we do partner work. And even when you're doing a test, it's still pretty fake. Uh, it's not you're actually trying to hurt people. Um, and so he was on the subway and he sees a really angry guy climb on the subway and he's like, oh. Let me just, let me just, let me just interject for people who don't know. Terry is a big hulky guy. He's like, looks like a biker, could be a, could be a bouncer, probably was. Continue. Uh, Aikido is really useful for bouncers. Um, and so he's on, he's on the subway and he sees this really angry guy come on and his brain is like, ah, I'm going to get to use my Aikido now. And the guy is like drunk and like being kind of dangerous and accosting people. And just before Terry's about to intervene and do his Aikido magic, a voice comes from the back of the subway car. It's an old, old man who says, Hey, and I'm forgetting how he intervened, but he said, you know, what's on your mind? And he, he basically talks. What have you been drinking? What have what you, been, you drinking? been drinking? Sake. Uh, I love sake. Thank you. Perfect. Me and my wife, we drink sake every night. And bonds with a fellow who ends up crying in the old man's arms. And Dobson says, I know where the real Aikido was in the subway car that night. It was the old man in the back of the car. Thank you, Ken. I just put a link to the YouTube to that. Yep. To the uh, original story or to the same uh, it's, to, it's a retelling of it, but. Um, okay. That, um, oh, good. Perfect. My retelling of Terry Dobson's train story from someone else. I love that. Thank you. Um, Ram Dass cool. tells it also. Yeah. It's a good story. And, 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 and a good story. there's a, 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 a two words that I often uh, contrast against each other. There's being defenseless and being undefended. And the difference between the two is really important. Being defenseless means somebody could come and beat you up. You don't know how to defend yourself. Being undefended means you know how to defend yourself, but you put your guard down, which is an invitation of trust. It's an opening. And I think being undefended is really, really good. It's very close to being vulnerable. It has a lot to do with making yourself vulnerable on purpose, but not knowing that you're not that vulnerable because you could protect yourself if you needed to. What does that turn into in social media debate? or political discourse, I'm unclear, but I think it's a good avenue. Uh, we have only a couple minutes left in this call. Uh, Ken, is it a moment for a poem? Sure, I'm um, just gonna put something in the chat. I, I've recently become 
rather enamored with uh, Jonathan Rosen, who I had not heard of until recently. Um, he used to head the, the RSA and uh, chess champion and degrees from Oxford and Harvard and Bristol, just really brilliant guy. Um, and he's just introduced something called the anti-debate. In fact, it was Gil Friend who originally alerted me to this. So um, I don't have it at my fingertips, but if you look at the anti-debate, it's talks a lot about how social media uh, destroys, you know, the ability to for people to converse um and it's like we need something different debate is broken what can we do so is anti-debate the answer um <clears throat> let's see i did choose a poem here as i was listening in and um see if you can figure out the connection to this poem with misinformation and power structures it's called pope joan after i learned to sub transubstantiate unleavened bread into the sacred host and swung the burning frankincense till blue-green snakes of smoke coiled round the hem of my robe, and swayed through those fervent crowds high up in a papal chair, blessing and blessing the air, nearer to heaven than cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests, being the vicar of Rome, having made the Vatican my home, like the best of men, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. But twice as virtuous as them, I came to believe that I did not believe a word. So I tell you now, daughters or brides of the Lord, that the closest I felt to the power of God was the sense of a hand lifting me up, flinging me down, lifting me up, flinging me down, as my baby pushed out from between my legs where I lay in the road in my miracle, not a man or a pope at all. Carol Ann Duffy. Um, from The World's Wife. Love that. Do you mind reading that again? Sure. <clears throat> a little sip of something in my throat here. Thanks. And will you post a link to it or the, the text to it to the OGM list or sure. the chat? Either sure. way. Thanks. Pope Jones. After I learned to transubstantiate unleavened bread into the sacred host and swung the burning frankincense till blue-green snakes of smoke coiled around the hem of my robe and swayed it through those fervent crowds high up in a papal chair, blessing and blessing the air, nearer to heaven than cardinals, archbishops, bishops, priests, being the vicar of Rome, having made the Vatican my home like the best of men. In nomine patres et patres et file et spiritus sancti, amen. But twice as virtuous as them, I came to believe that I did not believe a word. So I tell you now, daughters or brides of the Lord, that the closest I felt to the power of God was the sense of a hand lifting me up, flinging me down, lifting me flinging me down as my baby pushed out from between my legs where I lay in the road in my miracle, not a man or a pope at all. That is an awesome poem. Crazy good. Thank you, Ken. I had not heard that or heard of it or anything. I hadn't heard of Pope Joan. You'd never heard of Pope Joan? I don't think so. George Bernard Shaw wrote a play. And there's all sorts of stories about where this came from and what uh, what where the truth lies, whether it was in the, I think, I think it was either the 11th century or the 13th century. So this is like 13th century misinformation, just to tie well, a bow on it. That's one explanation. Just there's to put a little bow on it. I knew someone pick up on where the disinformation fit in. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, it's a, it's an amazing story. And uh, there, there's some hints that there was some bishop or somebody who lived this lie and got pregnant. Hmm. But the best part about the story was that she was, he, she was chosen because unlike the other candidates, she didn't have all these uh, children. The other cardinals all had kids and they wanted <laughs> to promote their sons in particular into high positions at the Vatican. And so this one candidate 
didn't have that problem, somewhat younger. And uh, that's why one of the reasons they picked her. Ah, the stories of the Medici popes hmm. and others. Well, as I say, this was probably 11th century. We're not sure. There's a, got to be a good book on papal misbehavior. Uh, <laughs> volumes. Yeah. And then there's the, the good pope or the new pope uh, with uh, uh, Judd. What's his name? Anyway, the actor. The, the young pope oh, yeah, yeah, is the yeah, series. Yeah. Um, what's his name? Are you talking about the young pope? Yeah. Jude Law? Yes, Jude Law. Thank you. There's also the movie The Two Popes, which yes. I went in very skeptical about, but I came out loving. It was really I, Hopkins and and um, Price, uh, Price doing an incredible job. I, I was really surprised that um, Benedict would pick Bergoglio as his successor. Like, like that kind of blew my brains. And, and that movie did a nice job of, of sort of setting that. Anyway, thank you all. This has been a treat. And uh, more soon. Uh, join me on the democracy call in a half hour. On um, the governance call. Damn it. Can I just say one thing, Jerry? Yes, please. Your surprise at Benedict um, making that choice. Yeah, uh, they're opposites. Yeah, we need room to be surprised by people who we think we have figured out. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, the the uh, back apparently to, back, to back to Stacy's point at the very beginning. Yeah, uh, okay. the the license the, the the license Raj in India is taken down by a bureaucrat, nobody uh, prime minister of India, who nobody thinks is going to do anything good, and all of a sudden the regs all change and things change for the better. It happens all the time, I guess, but we do need to be open for it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great. Call. Thank you all. See you soon. Everyone, bye.